over the last, I would say, two decades or so, we have had a, a great improvement in the treatment of HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. However, and unfortunately, the great majority of our patients will die because of this disease. So we should consider metastatic breast cancer, even HER2, still an unmet need. That's why we need more and better treatments to try to optimize, to, to, to increase the quantity and also the quality of the life. So uh, the state of care in the first line setting is quite clear. I think that the combination of uh, taxane plus trastuzumab per tuzumab, based on the Cleopatra trial, with a median progression free survival in the range of, of 18.7 months, is the more clear standard of care. I think this is something quite widely accepted. Also, the second line is quite clear. TDM1, based on the EMILIA trial, randomized phase three, which compared TDM1 against uh, capecitabine plus lapatinib, showed an improvement in progression free survival of, uh, with a median of about 9.6 months. And also, be, uh, based on this data, also improvement in survival, TDM1 is a clear standard of care in the second line setting. After them, what we have very, very clear we, we, is that we have to continue with anti 2 based uh, therapy. In this setting, uh, trastuzumab deruxtican or TDXD has shown impressive activity in heavily treated patients, showing an overall response rate in the range of 60 to 61%, and a median progression free survival in the range of 19.5 months, and a median overall survival in the range of 30 months. So taking all these aspects together, the Destiny Breast 03 wanted to compare in a face-to-face -face way TDM1, the standard of care in the second line setting, against TDXD, another antibody drug conjugate with some specific characteristics that might enhance the activity we observed with TDM1. So breast, um, uh, Destiny Breast 3 is a randomized phase 3 trial. So the methodology we used for this trial is the classical methodology for all phase 3 trials when well conducted. So in, in brief, patients with unresectable or metastatic HER2 positive uh, breast cancer were allowed to be included in this uh, trial. Of interest, those patients who received taxin and trastuzumab and uh, did have progressive disease earlier on time, during the first six months after finishing this adjuvant treatment, were also allowed to be included. So remember that one of the most important inclusion criteria in this trial was to have been received uh, trastuzumab and taxanes. Also of interest, patients could have had stable and treated brain metastasis. Stratific stratification factors included the hormone receptor status, prior treatment with pertuzumab or not, and the history of visceral disease. The primary point was progression free survival by a blinded independent central review. And the key secondary point is overall survival. Secondary points included overall response rate by investigator and central review, duration of response, PFS by investigator, and safety. It is also common to add different interim analyses to the, to the endpoints to demonstrate if the drug is good enough to stop the trial earlier on time. And um, we have the first interim analysis for progression free survival in May the 21st. And the Independent Data Monitoring Committee recommended to unblind the study in July the 30th, 2021, because the efficacy boundary for superiority was met. So the findings of the Destiny Brazil 3, in my opinion, uh, could not be uh, uh, more interesting. First, let me make a comment about the baseline characteristics about the patients that were included, highlighting three aspects. The first one is that about 20% of patients, more or less, did have a history of brain metastasis. About two-thirds of them, 60 to 62% of patients, had received previous pertuzumab, and about 89% of patients did have HER2 3+, plus, according to the central review. Let's go to the uh, primary objective, progression-free survival. Progression-free survival was improved with TDXD compared with TDM1, 
with a hazard ratio of 0.28. Highly statistically significant p-value 7.8 by 10 to minus 22. The median PFS was 6.8 and it was not reached with TDXD, it was 6.8 with TDM1. When we looked at this based on the investigator assessment, it was 7.2 with TDM1 and 25.1 with TDXD. So a very impressive improvement in progression-free survival. When we looked at the key subgroups, uh, hormone receptor positive or negative, prior or not treatment with, with pertuzumab, visceral disease or not, uh, a brain, brain metastasis or not, and prior lines of therapy, zero or one or more than two or two, we can observe that all subgroups did have the same impressive benefit with TDXD compared with TDM1. What about the key secondary endpoint? Overall survival, the hazard ratio was 0.56 and the p-value 0.0072. However, because of the pre-specified boundary was established in p-value less than 0.000265, did, did this uh, uh, analysis did not cross the pre-specified boundary. So at this time, overall survival was not achieved. The 12-month overall survival rate was over 94% with TDXD and in the range of 86% with TDM1, about 9% absolute improvement. Again, overall survival was not achieved from a statistical point of view at this first interim analysis. Another important endpoint, overall response rate, 80% of patients did achieve an objective response compared with 34 with TDM1. And of interest, 16% of patients did have complete response and only 1% of patients did have progressive disease as best response compared with 17.5% of patients who received TDM1. Just a few words about safety. In total, drug-related treatment emergent adverse events of grade 3 or higher was pretty much similar between them, 45% with TDXD, 40% with TDM1. Nevertheless, we, 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 we did have more treatment discontinuations for TDXD in the range of 12.8% than with TDM1 in the range of 5%. The great majority of treatment emerging adverse events were gastrointestinal or hematological in nature, 19.1% grade 3 or higher neutropenia with TDXD, 25% grade 3 or higher thrombocytopenia with TDM1. Other important adverse events were nausea, 6.6% grade 3 or higher with TDXD, and fatigue, 5% grade 3 or higher, again, with TDXD. Last but not least, some comments about adverse events of special interest. With TDXD, we had ILD pneumonitis in 27 patients, 10.5%, being grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3. We did not have grade 4 or grade 5 events. Nevertheless, only two patients, 0.8%, did have grade 3 ILD pneumonitis. And when we look at the left ventricular ejection fraction decrease, we only had seven patients, 2.7%, with any grade of uh, this, um, uh, this event. Nevertheless, very important to say that all reported adverse events of left ventricular ejection fraction decrease were asymptomatic and no cases of cardiac failure Occur. So these are more or less the most important findings of this study, which in my opinion led to consider this drug as the next standard of care in the second line setting. So in my opinion, we have now to consider how these data, these results might uh, be considered in the plethora, in the, in the, in the great uh, treatment uh, options we have to treat our patient with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. We all know that based on the Destiny Breast 01 study, the, the, the large phase two study with TDXD, in many countries, TDXD was a conditional approved uh, based on this data. And also in some countries, like in the United States and in others, TDXD is widely used in third, fourth line, or whatever. Now, when we look at this data, this data uh, in my opinion, might replace TDM1 by 
TDXD. If we have considered T1 as the preferred option in the second line setting, TDXD maybe in the future when regulatory um, agencies look at this data and approve the drug, I, I think that this might consider maybe consider the, the next standard of care in the second line setting. And maybe for those patients with very early uh, disease progression after neoadjuvant or adjuvant treatment, maybe this is even considered for the, lay, for, for the first line. So I think that based on this data, the drug will move forward in the clinical development. I think that we are running now a, a randomized phase three trial, which is also very, very interesting. In the first line HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer setting, TDXD or TDXD plus pertuzumab against or compared with the Cleopatra regimen. Also, I think that this drug is going moving forward into the early breast cancer setting. We have to discuss many different options here, but I would like to highlight now the face-to-face uh, -face against a uh, TN1 in the post neoadjuvant non-PCR patient population. Also, this drug is being explored in the third line or beyond against physicians' choice in patients who have received previous TN1. And finally, also we have very interesting data also in the head to low expressing tumors. And there is an ongoing clinical trial destined in breast 04, looking at this data compared with standard of care in, again, patients with HER2 low expressing metastatic breast cancer. Well, I would like to mention just one final comment. I think that we are living in a time where great drugs are coming. We're improving the quantity and quality of life of our patients, but we need more. We need more, we need more, we need more. More drugs and better drugs. This is one of the examples, in my opinion, this is the, one of the best drugs ever in the field of breast cancer. The improvement we have seen in Destiny Breast 3 is absolutely unprecedented. I don't know if with, if with this drug we are going to be able to cure some patients with metastatic disease. I would love to see that. But in the meantime, which is very clear is that our patients will live probably longer and better. So again, I would like to encourage the pharma companies to continue investing in, in, in clinical research, in the clinical research, in cancer research, because this is the only way to move forward if we want to cure this, this disease.